Hello traders, welcome to a new week of trading. My name is John Kickletter, I'm Chief Strategist here at DailyFX.com and we're here to, as we usually are, Monday, to discuss the top fundamental themes that are impacting our market, of course what has been driving our market this past week, and more importantly what is going to be motivating price action for the week ahead. Before I can get into the uh, role of it, uh, I do need a confirmation of why or yes will do that you can see and hear. Currently we're looking at the US dollar index, Dow Jones FXCM dollar index. If you can see that and you can hear my voice, then just give me a why yes and we can dive right into our conversation. Let's try once more. If you can see in here, just give uh, a Y yes in the uh, event box on the right. Uh, it might come up with a refresh of the page where you click the live now uh, segment. Or you can also put it through Twitter. Uh, that will work as well. Ah, oh, there we go. All right, I see you in both Twitter and uh, in the cover at live box. Okay, thank you. So let's dive into our conversation. There are a couple things that are actually ongoing, and I will try to keep us abreast of it as it unfolds, but uh, one of the big things that uh, is still happening now is actually the Greek conversation. It started at 1300 GMT. Uh, right now we're actually at 1630 GMT. Uh, and some things have spilled out over the edges uh, in terms of topics and what they've suggested. doesn't like there's going to be a definitive solution today. Surprise, surprise. Uh, instead, it looks like they're rolling out for an accord on debt uh, out to May the 24th. Nevertheless, we will see if there is anything of substance that they uh, push through. We'll talk about the Greek situation, although I think it's been relegated to the backdrop, unfortunately. Um, I do think it carries a lot of weight in terms of uh, the strength and the future of the euro, as does the Brexit concerns, which will also be something we talk about today. But before we get into that, let's talk about uh, one of the most impressive moves we've seen as of this past weekend carrying through into this new trading week, dollar. Here's the Dow Jones FXCM dollar index, as I said, and we are now up for five consecutive trading days. The duration, five straight days, and the pace you can see here through the rate of change. A five-day rally of this magnitude, last one we saw was back in August, or late August. Uh, that was the recovery after the uh, sharp financial correction that we had in capital markets. All right. There's that Dow Jones Industrial Average sell-off. Dollar was also dropping. And you might ask yourself, why in the world is the U.S. dollar, which we consider to be a safe haven currency, dropping in the event of that uh, risk aversion move? Well, it's because there is a substantial amount of interest in the dollar that's predicated on its position as a early adoption funding currency. All right, so they're talking about, or sorry, uh, carry currency. We're talking about Fed rate hikes and the potential that it uh, generates a lot of uh, preceding capital flow. Not a lot of actual carry. All right. 25 basis points, and even if we were very aggressive and said, let's say, 75 basis points worth of hikes in the span of a 12-month period, 75 basis points is not a lot of carry to really encourage people into the market. But rather what we're seeing is people are front-running these changes. And they do the same thing on the opposite side. When a central bank uh, says that it's going to cut rates or it's going to introduce a QE, in other words, they're going to ramp up the supply side of the currency, then investors don't really see too much in the way of carry to be had of it, the interest income, but rather they see a commendable uh, effort to try to drive one's currency up or down. And might as well get in front of that move. Right? Front-running the central banks. Very popular back in 2008-2009 when the Treasury and when the, uh, when the Federal Reserve uh, started to implement those uh, TARP, TALF, and QE programs. All right. Getting into the Treasuries and getting into the dollar was a, uh, a low-boundary kind of setup. 
So this is the same kind of situation that we see here with the US dollar uh, being treated back in August as a risky currency. It's not. All right? I think it's worked off a lot of that risk component. But it is nevertheless something that uh, warped or distorted the market's view. And we still see that relative monetary policy and people trying to front run central banks. All right? That is still something that uh, continues to dictate a lot of price action. Uh, namely right now in the euro and the yen. So an impressive move comparable to the one of the most violent uh, or post uh, crises periods in the financial system for risk reversion that we had seen in a very long time. Uh, before that it was back uh, a year ago, May 22nd, a five day run uh, back here that uh, marked a bottom. All right, but be cautious. We also seen a five day uh, rate of change that was greater that also marked the peak. And whether we're looking for, and I've been doing this for single day moves, I've been doing this for three day moves, and as it continues, I am uh, updating the measurement. The interest here that I have is to, from a technical perspective, we say, all right, well, this is a clearly catalyzing move, or we say this is an exhaustion move. We can't make that assessment on this particular move alone. We have to put it into context. One of the aspects, if you want to do purely technical, remember this is a fundamental uh, discussion, but I want to give it uh, context. But one way of doing this is saying, all right, where is this rally beginning? Is it beginning from a low, a relative significant low, or is it uh, beginning at the uh, top end of a major trend? This instance was the top end of a major trend. This instance was the low. All right, so you get different results. Here we have it from a significant low after months of general bear trend, if not uh, sideways price action. But you're also still at the upper end of a multi-year range. So it's not an easy answer, and what we would do beyond this analysis is saying, all right, what's the fundamentals? What would project the dollar to exhaust itself and subsequently fall apart, reverse? What would uh, drive the U.S. dollar to back up towards 12-year highs and beyond? Well, the fundamental uh, pressure, the catalysts that we would look for that are uh, individually or uniformly uh, market moving so that it can actually dictate a move of that magnitude are somewhat light. All right? We don't have high profile event risk uh, dead ahead of us that can promise to accomplish that. This is especially true of uh, this week where the docket is much lighter for those high profile top tier uh, catalysts. As you can see, there are Fed speeches, there are a couple of indicators, there are even some upstream inflation forecasts as well as sentiment surveys. But those aren't the high profile event risks that we had, for example, for last week, non-farm payrolls, or from the week before that. When we had the combination of the FOMC rate decision as well as the US GDP reading. All right, those are high profile, concentrated event risks. Those are events that can single-handedly change the assumptions uh, of market bearing and market circumstance. If we wanted to whittle it down to one of the major themes, we could say it can ultimately change the Fed's conviction for actually moving markets for rate expectations, uh, or, and, it could uh, alter the bearings of risk appetite trends. This kind of data had that level of influence. Of course, it fell short, it generated some volatility, but it wasn't capable of really redefining the trend. Now this week, we are light on those uh, definitive events. All right. And this is going to make it a little bit more difficult for the dollar to decide whether it's going to be able to continue to run or whether it's going to falter. I think this is going to depend less on the 
benchmark for Fed timing, which will certainly be updated. The market will track it pretty closely. But realistically speaking, there's nothing that significant that can individually or uh, by itself dictate a timing, a reasonable timing expectation for, uh, let's say, a June rate hike. Or uh, if we were looking at the exact contrast, if you're an extreme dove, uh, saying a June 2017 rate hike. Nothing that we have on this docket will say definitively we are shifting uh, one way or the other. Risk trends can always come out of the out of the blue, right? And sentiment, as it's dictated by some of these benchmarks, like the uh, Dow Jones Industrial Average and S and P 500, it's capable of seeing a downturn and a break from here. And it's not going to get to the high profile, full scale uh, intensity risk aversion that would say panic. But it is certainly enough to cover the range and develop a, a head of steam for risk aversion. And all you need really is some momentum behind that theme and it can quickly become self-sustaining. So risk uh, trends as always are going to be uh, at the top end of my concern. For the dollar, a haven status is something that I think uh, can very well uh, arise as a uh, primary driver. Recent history says that they move in uh, opposite directions, but I think uh, we are seeing certainly a return to those more traditional conditions because people are withdrawing some of their expectations, their pricing, their positioning to say that, oh, an early Fed rate hike will uh, be something that I should chase. I should chase the yield that provides. People are much more reticent to chase low yield at all costs. Yes, they're still needing to generate a return in an extremely low yield market, but I think the risks are becoming a little bit more tangible, more apparent to most investors. And now the dollar reverts to more of its safe haven status. So this week is going to be difficult for the dollar to mark a clear bearing, not without the intervention of a significant and unexpected catalyst. The docket, the economic calendar, simply doesn't carry the ammo necessary to generate the big market movement itself. If you're looking for event risk data, I would say watch the inflation figures import, because much of the energy consumed in the United States is still imported. I would say watch the PPI figure on Friday and the consumer sentiment survey. This is important in particular because not only does it take the temperature of a very important group within the U.S. economy, but it is also a breakdown of survey uh, components that include inflation expectations, job growth forecasts, economic forecasts. All right, decent data, but like I said, this is not the full-scale influence that we would be looking for. All right, so that is tangible, scheduled data. But our focus is probably going to have to be on those things that are intangible. Now, if we're looking for risk trends, I would uh, certainly direct your attention to some of the U.S. equity indexes. And to, uh, certainly deserving our attention are the European and Asian uh, equity indexes. All right, some different uh, scope and scale to them. Yes, I always use technical analysis, and that helps uh, support the fundamental analysis and vice versa. So th there is definitely good reason to incorporate both. But when it comes to the actual risk assessment, it's best to look at it from a market-wide perspective, right? And looking at these variety of risk-oriented asset classes, uh, some of the things that I think are worthy of our focus include high yield. High yield fixed income or corporate debt has been a uh, attractive vehicle during the heights of the risk chasing days, and they are certainly under increased pressure uh, during the risk aversion periods. Emerging markets are also very 
remarkable in terms of their uh, spillover influence. And even if you want to get particular, uh, I think that there is a lot of uh, interest in China, so USDC and H, as well as uh, unique ones that don't have necessarily as much spillover influence, but are nevertheless uh, big stories in, in, the, in the spotlight nowadays, like the uh, Brazilian uh, impeachment situation. In a world where we're in, a, in essence, a drought, all right, and we're in a forest with a lot of very dry tender, it doesn't take much of a spark to get sentiment moving. So we don't need, necessarily, uh, an absolute devastating crisis to spur in a self-sustaining track. You just need something of enough substance that it can have a spillover effect. So always keeping a very watchful eye on the broad reach of risk trends. And unfortunately, we haven't seen as definitive a move one way or the other. Uh, well, I, I should say that the three months up until uh, almost the beginning of May were certainly impressive enough from a risk appetite perspective. but. The market seem disengaged. All right? They think that risk trends are not where the action is, and the potential there is small. But in reality, it is quite subst uh, substantial, and it can quickly uh, engulf our markets and our positions and redirect everything. All right? So it, it, complacency becomes an incredible danger when it comes to something as prolific and widespread as risk trends. So don't write it off just because the Dow, for example, hasn't broke below the trend line that we see here. Don't write it off because you don't see a, a concern about uh, Brazil or a concern about Greece or a concern about oil immediately turning to a systemic outflow of capital from risk assets. This is certainly a high profile theme and when it starts rolling, it rolls over everything. And the quicker we're able to make that assessment and transition, the faster we're going to be on the path to the right fundamental movers. There is always a risk of when we focus on one particular theme. A good example, uh, relative monetary policy. Relative monetary policy has been an enormous market mover. All right, but as of about a year, year and a half ago, the relative positioning of these central banks and their policy approaches, whether Kiwi programs versus uh, slow normalization, which is the difference between the euro and the U.S. dollar, for example, that has dictated for a number of years a pretty distinct and straightforward uh, fundamental path, and price would in turn follow. But then we find we start to see a sever between these uh, cause and effect kind of expectations. That's because we started to see a shift in what the market was really paying attention to in stimulus versus uh, Fed rate hike speculation. All right, they anticipated that it uh, would not be able to go so far, and they subsequently de-emphasized its importance on both ends, and then the market started to fall out of the uh, clear, uh, linear anticipation track. And for months, people were confused, thought fundamentals no longer worked at all, and either it led to wrong trades or people were just sitting on the sidelines because they didn't, they didn't know uh, what was going on. The quicker we're able to make uh, or identify and uh, adapt to these changes in fundamental importance and bearing, the better off we're going to be in terms of more quickly uh, associating and identifying the trades. All right. So, risk. Always, always keep risk on the forefront of your mind. Now, outside of the dollar and outside of the general bearings of risk, both of which will be somewhat difficult to dictate clear uh, catalyst to momentum, there is some currency-specific uh, developments that I think that we should keep close track of this week. Since the euro is already uh, paying attention to the Greece now, I guess we'll start with the euro. Before we analyze what's going on there, let's take a look at the euro itself. Not much movement on the day. 
a small range for the euro USD and not uh, any n not any uh, defining uh, momentum convictions that we can suss out of this position uh, it's not uh, dropping it's not rising it's very much a narrow range day with a lack of conviction one way or the other now of course the focus this morning is not the data that we have although we did have uh, some interesting data uh, I think in particular the investor confidence figures from Syntex is noteworthy uh, we did have a improvement to 6.2 expected of 6 and from a previous 5.7. This is encouraging because it suggests that investors uh, in the Eurozone are seeing conditions improve despite uh, ongoing uncertainties like Greece all right, or the EU referendum and Brexit. So that's encouraging but when it comes down to it this is what's going to have really the true influence. The Eurozone ministers were holding an extra uh, meeting that was specifically directed towards the discussion of Greece. And there was hope that perhaps something would come of it, that uh, realistically they're trying to work through uh, contingency necess uh, necessities. Uh, Greece was hoping to find a uh, approval of uh, additional debt because quickly running out of money but the IMF said that they were not uh, willing to play party to this unless there were some di direct contingencies or uh, the uh, the creditors uh, the Troika members that, uh, that uh, exclude uh, the IMF are willing to uh, allow some debt forgiveness alright so another uh, haircut which many of the EU uh, participants are very against so it's it's still an impasse all right this long meeting is just now wrapping up and they are uh, saying a number of things uh, so uh, some of the things that Digel Bloom have said since we started contingency steps will be uh, legislated up front and will come automatically uh, had first discussion on Greek debt relief. No decisions uh, that were made that day, as I said before. Looks like they're going to push back a, a final decision to May 24th. However, they've pushed back final decisions on items like this multiple times. Uh, so don't uh, expect this to be a hard day in the future. Exploring longer r uh, grace periods for Greek debt and says it's uh, looking at steps that should allow for the IMF to participate given uh, Madame Lagarde's uh, very reticent role in this uh, drama. Now Regling and Moscovici are speaking but saying the same things. So in essence we're pushing this further and further along. All right, further, further afar, uh, or further afield as it said, uh, and pushing back a solution for Greece is, I mean, frankly, it's been something we've seen for the past five plus years. So it's, the market has become completely uh, passive when it comes to any news about Greece or its, its situation, because there doesn't seem to be any recourse or final solution that is given for better or for worse. So it's presumed that this can be duct taped and pushed along a little bit further, a little bit further, a little bit further. We never have to come to any kind of uh, hard, fast outcome. And that actually, from uh, an FX trader's perspective, must be quite fine. As long as this situation, I mean, uh, Greece not doing well economically is always a underlying concern full of investment and confidence are never going to be found if Greece, a member of the Eurozone, uh, can't uh, work its way up to a true recovery. But at the same time, if Greece is struggling but it's still kept within the fold, stable enough that I can invest in, let's say, Germany or France or Italy or a diversified investment within the Eurozone, that is seen as positive. It's when the threat of Greece actually not being capable of working with the requirements of the Troika that it becomes untenable, that it becomes a very serious risk to trade.
I wouldn't want my investments in Germany if it looked like a Eurozone member was uh, about to leave. Why? Because the Eurozone is essentially a foundation uh, set by assumptions, expectations, that the economy is very robust and that its membership is unbreakable. When one of these countries can leave, more can leave. And that's a serious issue for the Eurozone, which is the European Monetary Union, the common countries that use the same currency, the aggregate GDP that this represents is very important. One, just shaving off Greece is not a small thing. That is a sizable chunk of total GDP that all of a sudden vanishes. What's more, when you see a uh, major player like Greece leave, and yes, they are a major player, uh, pretty much anybody in the Eurozone is a major player because of the influence of a first mover status has here. It can encourage other larger countries. Why would Italy, who has a major debt load, want to stick around when all this uncertainty arises and they see a way out? Or Spain, where the anti-EU uh, sentiment is very strong, why would we expect them to stay? Now they say there is a way out. Greece piloted it for us. So there is still an enormous amount of risk associated to the euro, and we need to watch that very closely. Not resolved here, but Greece is not done. Later in the week on Friday, we have the second round of GDP figures from the Eurozone and Germany, for example. All right, this is actually useful because we get to see all the details in the German GDP figures. But we also have some of the struggling countries from the Eurozone during the crisis, the Eurozone crisis. Uh, Portugal and uh, Spain were among them, but it's really Greece that we're going to be watching. All right. So this is still an ongoing uncertainty and risk that we need to watch for very closely this week. The other particular currency that I find is worth watching for scheduled event risk, all right? So uh, definitive uh, posted event risk is the British pound. Now the British pound, when it comes to the Bank of England rate decision, we usually say, uh, doesn't matter. They're not gonna do anything. And when they don't do anything, they don't uh, give us any detail to work on in terms of speculating their path, their subsequent moves, whether f bullish, bearish, hawkish, dovish. But this is one of the uh, special ones, just like the Fed. On a quarterly basis, the FOMC rate decision, and that's the March, June, September, December meetings, they update their forecasts for growth, for inflation, for employment, and for interest rates. And that's certainly very market moving even in uh, decisions which go unchanged. And we have to relegate ourselves to breaking down a policy statement, reading it word for word. I mean, the Wall Street Journal even has a, uh, has a blog page dedicated to uh, tracking the specific changes in the Federal Reserve's policy statement. All right, that's how, uh, how focused this becomes. Well, this is a little bit more straightforward. This is the quarterly inflation report, also called Super Thursday, uh, in which we get the rate decision which comes with the monetary policy statement, it comes with the vote count, and it comes with the quarterly inflation report. That's what we want to see, that quarterly inflation report in, in particular. That's, a, that's their equivalent of the Fed's forecasts. Not as straightforward, but nevertheless very market moving. Now, the British pound is at some um, crucial levels. Looking at the pound dollar, we come back to this 100-day moving average. Also happens to be the point at which we uh, took a very long time to break a consolidation pattern to mark progress to the upside versus the U.S. dollar. Will the British pound really regain traction against its U.S. counterpart and be treated with the same kind of uh, abject uh, optimism or hawkishness that the greenback has been able to uh, win over for the past four years. You might say, well, the dollar's been uh, struggling as of late. As of late is being the operative comparison there because generally that trend is very bullish. And when we look at it 
the trend has been very bearish for the pound dollar. So is this finally going to give us something of uh, substance to develop fundamental traction to the upside? Euro pound, carving out uh, the right shoulder potentially of the inverse head and shoulders pattern. This 77.50 level down here, very important as you can see all right, from a technical basis. All right, that's a very important uh, level for which we'll say there is going to be strong uh, follow through or not. I have my pound kiwi to the upside. Big picture, is this going to mark a meaningful uh, recovery? The pound Aussie has been a big one. I noted that in the real time newsfeed just before we began. Strong swing to the upside, helped uh, certainly by the Australian dollar's weakening. And yes, this BOE event is going to carry a lot of potential to drive it forward. However, there's always going to be a cloud hanging over the British pound, for better or worse. All right, it'll kind of act as an anchor, prevent very profound momentum. And that's that uh, ongoing concern in the Bank of England's, or sorry, the uh, UK's upcoming referendum vote as to whether the uh, UK will stay within the European Union as scheduled for June 23rd. Still a long ways off. However, not so long that it's it's going to be completely irrelevant to the market and out of sight, out of mind kind of way. Because I, as I keep here on my chart for my own purposes, but I share with you guys, um, I keep the September 18th Scottish referendum and the May 7th Actually, it was the weekends before. Uh, May 7th, general election, UK election. I keep these up because look at the price action that preceded this. It became very volatile. Very volatile. Speculation started to take over. Focus on this event started to intensify. And it's not decisive. It can't be decisive until you actually see the event print. All right, You see who was voted into government. You see whether uh, Scotland decided to stay within the UK or leave. But weeks before the actual votes in both accounts, the markets became highly, highly volatile. And volatility without consistency, because there's no certainty uh, uh, projecting the event, means that you're going to have very high probability of reversals. And we had a couple of those preceding them. So we have to expect the same thing. Well, I do have a long pound kiwi position, uh, and its general intention is for medium to long term. I'm going to have to be very mindful of what the market's capable of achieving given those circumstances, given that uncertainty that we have out into the future. And it's not so far that the market will not uh, account for it now. So the British pound has high probability of volatility this week. And as we get, uh, as each week passes and we progress towards the actual June 23rd rate, uh, EU referendum, things are going to get a little bit more erratic and likely volatile. So be cautious of that and make sure that's, uh, that's anticipated into any kind of trade that you are setting up for the, uh, for the pound, medium to long term. I would also make note of a couple of events that are not in the traditional majors, all right, but nevertheless need to be watched very closely. We'll take it day by day. So we learned this morning all right, that the a lower house uh, a lower house uh, or a lower court, sorry, there you go. A lower court decided to annul the impeachment proceedings against uh, the Brazilian president. This has led to some remarkable volatility when it comes to the Brazilian real. This is a situation that is very fluid. You might say, well, don't you, uh, we don't trade the Brazilian real. As true of a statement as that is, uh, Brazil 
is a very important player in the global economy as uh, first an emerging market, a key emerging market player, but then those emerging market economies and aggregate have been very uh, res very important in terms of the response uh, the responsibility of generating strong global growth from the great financial crisis back in 2008 to the recovery that we have today. So if these emerging market, uh, these dominant emerging market economies start to stall and fail, and think about it, uh, just the BRICS alone, Brazil, all right, m major economic problems, Russia, sanctions hit and oil uh, values down, major economic problems, China, second largest economy in the world, is managing and trying to proactively cool its own economy to prevent a bubble and a crisis explosion. India is doing all right. South Africa, all right. all right. But they, too, have seen their output significantly slowed. Those bricks together account for a very large percentage of global GDP. The second largest economy in the world, the eighth largest economy in the world, and progressively, uh, I think, the 11th for Russia. These are very important economies. These are not small players. And their influence on the bigger picture is significant. So we, it, we do have the, uh, that news from Brazil to start off the day, but we also have plenty of emerging market development through the rest of the week. All right, we're gonna, someday we're going to have the uh, lending figures for April. Very important for China. They don't give us a specific day to operate with, um, which is unfortunate. Inflation figures from China, less important. The lending figures are key. We have Russian foreign reserves, how much they have, have had to dedicate to their uh, effort to offset the sanctions that have been imparted upon their economy. I don't know what's going to happen of this lower house vote for the presidential impeachment in Brazil, but that uh, was scheduled for Wednesday. All right, Russia trade balance, and I do have a Hong Kong GDP, which I think is uh, very indicative of China. Uh, Hong Kong is a relative; it's it's a complicated uh, economic organization, but it is a very good proxy for China and its ultimate performance. So I'm going to be watching that one actually very closely for a bigger assessment of China itself. I would also make note of a few monetary policy uh, developments that we're going to look at. Uh, the BOJ Governor Kuroda speaking, I think this is very important. Always aware of the threat that uh, Japanese officials, and that's not just BOJ officials, that's also the Ministry of Finance, of intervention. All right. Intervention threats are always being made. Are they going to make good on them? That's the question. All right. And we do not know if that's going to absolutely be the case. More importantly, we don't know how effective it would be. But the constant ongoing threat that something can happen certainly does keep the yen crosses from marking uh, more substantial progress to the downside. So it might only be a speech, but we can't undercut the importance of this particular speech and how quickly it can turn into something substantial. We have the New Zealand uh, non-bond holdings. That's actually a carry trade figure. It's not really, uh, that's more of a result of monetary policy. Uh, we do have the RBNZ uh, releasing its financial stability report and an hour later, the Governor Wheeler uh, speaking about it. So that's going to be noteworthy to see where they stand on the scale. I am also interested, however, in the Norges Central Bank decision, Norway Central Bank, and the South Korea Central Bank decision. They might say, well, why are Norway's and South Korea's central bank policy decisions so important? Because what they decide is dictated by what the larger central banks are doing and what they feel is necessary to respond to that effort, to keep their own situation stable. In other words, this is a great way of measuring the knock-on effects of the major central banks. There is not just a, a positive of accommodation or tightening, as is the, is the case of the Fed. There are negatives, there are costs related to these efforts as well. 
And we see those costs in other central banks uh, of other countries who are smaller, and they are dependent upon these large economies, either as trade partners or for financial pegging or the like. Norway is dictated by the ECB's policies. It's one of the European Union members, but it's not a Eurozone member. And this creates a contrast which they have to try to keep stable. Very difficult to do. South Korea is a huge trade partner with the United States, and also Japan is the region's largest player, with the exception of China, of course. And they're torn between two very divergent monetary policies, and uh, there's been constant uh, consternation of the South Korean Central Bank uh, governor saying that uh, Japan is giving itself an undue uh, advantage in its policies. All right. So we want to see what they these central banks are doing because it's indicative of the struggle that they re and they reflect and they suffer uh, from the changes that the bigger central banks are doing. Okay. All right. So keep a a wary eye, a watchful eye on these markets. As you can see, there is certainly a lot of scheduled event risk and some of the top event risk is the euro area GDP figures that we're going to get towards the end, particularly Greece, uh, and the Super Thursday BOE decision. Those are noteworthy, they're tangible, and they have a very particular time release. That's, that's very convenient. But the big market movers are probably going to be those that aren't as definitive, that don't even have a time connected to them, like wrist trends. Always a focus for me, and always a concern for me. Keeping a weathered eye will make sure that we are uh, responsive as these things come through. Uh, there will certainly be a lot of volatility this weekend uh, if uh, market conditions continue to unfold in the direction that we've seen. You're probably going to see the development of some uh, moderate trends. Decisive trends for the dollar. Decisive trends for anything with the risk orientation to it. Uh, so that can be something like uh, equities or emerging markets. That can also be uh, the yen crosses or even pairs like the Aussie USD or the Kiwi USD uh, relegated to some questionable relationships to risk on, risk off, or carry interest. They can realign to risk trends. However, we just don't know what exactly is going to catalyze it, which ultimately is why it is so effective. All right, so... Being watchful, being ready, is going to be very important. All right. We'll wrap it up here. Thank you guys for joining me. If you have any questions, as always, you can come and join me in the Daily Effects On Demand session. Uh, I will be hosting it tonight. Uh, or if you're not a Daily Effects On Demand member, you can always bring your questions in the uh, trading Q&A back in Daily Effects Plus tomorrow. All right. Either way, an option to ask a question, and we can get them as answered as best we can. Until then, I wish you good luck trading out there.